they started fighting the government from 2009, 2010, when their leader, the founder of the group, was killed by the Nigerian military, and then they kind of uh, became really uh, very confrontational with the government. And their ideology basically is to um, resist Western education on the name Boko Haram. Recently, about 21 of them were released um, because of negotiations between the government and the terrorist group. So about 23 girls have been released since they were kidnapped. Um, the rest are still there with the terrorists. Um, what's the motive of Boko Haram? As you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, sometimes the discourse about the terrorism is uh, these people are led by Iran and resume hatred. Sometimes the discourse is these are uh, people with an unerring strategic logic. Where do, where do you come down on that? You know, it's, it's I think the logic, their, their, their ideology, if you want to call it that, is in the name of the group. Um, like I said, the, the word Boko Haram is from the Hausa word. Hausa Boko means Western education. Um, and Haram. Basically, they are against all forms of Western education and anything that's connected to that. So we're talking about democracy, and they want to bring Sharia law to replace the um, democratic government in Nigeria. So basically, they don't recognize the, the government of Nigeria. They don't recognize any form of government that's not based on, on the Sharia law. And um, even the, the nominal Sharia that we have in most northern Nigerian states, they see that as not being strict enough. So they want like literal Sharia, where you have cutting off of hands and um, segregation in schools between boys and girls. And you know, the the schools they want are not the typical kind of schools that you have. They want Islamic schools. So that is their ideology. And in the beginning, what they did, when they started emerging, they, they moved out of the society because they really didn't want to live in a society governed by the, by, the, by, the, by the state and all that. So they moved to a remote region of the state and formed their own community there. So they were living there um, at when they started. Of course, later they moved into the city and started fighting the government. But the idea is just to fight the government, fight the Nigerian government, until they ins institute um, Sharia law and, and Islamic law in Nigeria. Now, this is roughly where you grew up, uh, and you're going back home to do this book. How have things changed, and, and what made them change so much? Um, things have changed a lot. Because, like I said, the war has been going on for about five, six years now. Um, Nigeria is a very big country. We're talking about a country of about 200 million people. Um, the northeastern region is really big, especially um, this state where Boko Haram um, started. It's called Borno State in northeastern Nigeria. And it's situated just next to two other countries. They have Chad, Chad Republic, and Cameroon. So it's kind of, um, there's a lot of movement, you know, across the borders between, um, between Borno State to Nigeria and the other countries. So the, the, this, this, this is a very prosperous region because of the trade between the countries. And it used to be very vibrant, um, you know, um, kind of peace loving, if you like. Um, everything was going on well, um, at least when I went there a long time ago. So when I went there now, it's just surprising to see the destruction, um, the, 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 the buildings destroyed, the roads totally destroyed. Because they used to, 
pick up holes and, and very improvised explosive devices in the road and all that. Um, so you, you see, I was talking to one of the one journalists today, and I told him that the visual I came back with is the, the ghost towns when you drive you know, in Borno State, you pass these villages. This string of villages, there will be no single individual um, living there. It's just overgrown with grasses. The roofs of the houses are all broken down. And uh, there's no people. All the people have, you know, run away um, to the cities and they're living in these um, refugee camps in, in Medjugorje. So that's really, uh, it's, it's like a visual change that you see immediately when you go there. Um, the last question for you for now is, um, as I hope you all know, uh, Helan is mostly working these days as a fiction writer, um, a very acclaimed novelist. What made you decide to go back to writing nonfiction in this instance? Um, what is my first book of nonfiction? Hopefully not the last. Um, I, 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 I thought, you know, this subject matter is something that I want to write about immediately um, and specifically um, because I know fiction, fiction is interesting, you can universalize, um, you can write about a particular thing as a metaphor for larger things. Um, so I don't want to use this as a metaphor for anything, I want this to be literal, I'm writing about this thing. Um, I don't want to have any ambiguity, any um, ambivalence about this subject, I just want to write about Boko Haram and the girls that were kidnapped and I want my leader to exactly understand what I'm talking about. Um, so I thought, you know, nonfiction is the best way to, to do this, to be to be as direct as possible. So that's really why I chose um, to do nonfiction for this. Um, our next panelist, if you move down the line for me, is uh, Brian Markham. Uh, he's director of graduate studies and professor of anthropology at Barnard and Columbia. And uh, you know, his academic work is, is primarily about Nigeria. Um, if you could kind of take a stab at the larger context in which the events in Helan's book are happening. How do we understand you know, what's going on in, in, in Nigeria, particularly the part of Nigeria? <coughs> I mean, you could say there's two main contexts. One would be a Nigeria-specific one, and then one would be maybe a broader jihadi. Uh -huh. And it's worth, it's, it is very unique what's happened with Boko Haram. So this comes at one moment in a long history of religious violence in Nigeria, particularly Muslim-Christian uh, conflict, but also Muslim-Muslim conflict. Uh, most of which would be in the Northwest rather than the Northeast, and most of which took on a particular form, which however terrible it was, and there were awful crises in 2000 and 2001 in Kaduna and Joss, and other northern cities, where something like 2,000 people were killed in each of these conflicts, and the entire cities were separated into Muslim areas and Christian areas. Th that violence was terrible, but it was very well known. And there was a long history of it in Nigeria, going back to the Civil War, and even before the pogroms that led to the Civil War. The Boko Haram phenomenon is really a different form of violence. There were no suicide bombings. There were no coordinated actions of producing videos around violence to get a certain publicity around. So the style of violence comes then from Boko Haram's connection to this broader jihadi movement, which it is an avatar in some sense. So as Boko Haram began to switch, Boko Haram name is not the name they use themselves, and they've changed their name to become a branch of the Islamic State in Africa. Um, and they draw on that broader current of jihadi thought, which takes place in different ways. But they're clearly looking outside of Nigeria for training, not just training in terms of arms, but training in terms of production, media production. How do you shoot the jihadi video? How do you get it onto YouTube? How do you present your information? These things were not part of the landscape locally in Nigeria. And it means that Boko Haram always had from the get-go an international audience in mind, in some way, both an Islamic one and a non-Islamic one. And in that sense, they're a bit more like men in the Delta region, these, you know, movements there which were always busily mediating themselves as they were kidnapping oil workers or doing other sorts of things or getting Sebastian Milner and other people to write Vanity Fair pieces about what they were doing. They were seeking publicity in a very different way. 
So I think there's, that's the two main contexts. And, um, and if you look at the violence, I mean, the Boko Haram thing, there was, you know, it began with attacks on the Nigerian state, on, in a sense, secular institutions of the Nigerian state, on the police force, on other sorts of state institutions. It then moved into attacks on other Muslims, assassinations of clerics, bombings of mosques. So it then is an internal tension between different Muslim movements, many of whom have Salafist inclinations. It's not this is just a Salafist movement. The people they're assassinating and killing also draw from that tradition, you know, but in a different way. And then they began to turn to attacks on Christians. So the Chibok kidnapping is part of this turn when they began to specifically attack Christians. And even then, it's interesting to note it's only northern, so far it's only really the northern Christians. And in Nigeria, there would be a distinction between Christians in the north and Christians in the south. And there's a big split between northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria. And Boko Haram have been regionally very focused, primarily in the northeast, venturing out into the northwest, but never going south. So it's a, it's a very particular, there's a particular configuration to that that looks in these different directions at the same time. Um, our, our final panelist going this way is Shabana Shankar. She's a professor of history at Stony Brook University um, and a specialist on British West Africa. Um, let me ask you to sort of bring uh, the state into the conversation. Um, is why is the, a, a version of why is this happening? Is it a weak state? Is it a changing state? Is it a legacy of Christian-Muslim relationships have been 
been much better in the previous periods of Nigerian history. Uh, basically, I think you could say also up until the 1980s when the, there's this series of riots brought about by the new Taksime um, group. Uh, there are also very significant points, I think, in this book. It's a very useful book to think about Christian Muslim relations historically because to the mountains. And so, for example, some of the groups like the Chibok groups were isolated from Islamic statehood um, and were actually sort of exploited by the Muslim state. Um, and it's and slavery, historically, in the trans-Saharan context, women were predominantly enslaved. So I think we could actually think about longer history of the theft of um, girls and women in this area. Uh, but Helan makes the point that converting to Christianity Chibok was the only local government area in uh, Borno State that out of 27 that has a Christian leader. Um, it has a heavy Christian presence. He makes the argument, which I would agree with, that Christianity was um, uh, a response to being um, apart from the Muslim former Muslim state and also a refuge or a haven from um, from uh, the Islamic state as it was constructed. So um, there are a lot of, despite that, there had been ways that Muslims and Christians had lived together, um, but he also traces that there were these microaggressions, I think it was called, and I think he called it, um, it was a persistent and sort of gradual jihad in that getting jobs was difficult um, for Christians, or um, uh, there might have been other ways in which or the local government might not favor a Muslim, I mean a Christian, but um, the explosion of Similarity in 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 some of the drivers that brought about this. Um, when we had the Metasine uprising, the very first of its kind, when you have um, this Islamist group attacking um, civilians, people, um, both Muslims and non-Muslims, by this extremist Islamic group who sees other Muslims as moderate Muslims as being infidels, basically. So. Um, when that happened the first time, in around 1985, <coughs> there were similar conditions. We were living under a democracy at that time, and there was so much restlessness, joblessness, um, kind of dissatisfaction, and um, kind of perceived um, corruption by the leaders. So there, there was that kind of complaint. And the leaders of that first uprising in Metasini group kind of accused the government of kind of really being um, not caring for the people, not taking care of the people. And I see a repeat of that now because the Jonathan government, when, when these things happened, um, was blatantly corrupt and there was a lot of dissatisfaction from people. And some of them saw the answer to that kind of um, governmental corruption. The only answer is to turn to religion, extremist religion. So when you have people like like um, this charismatic leader Mohammed Yusuf saying that you know government is not going to solve your problems, the only answer is to turn to religion. We need a strict version of Sharia. That's the only place you can get justice. That's the only place you can get you know um, solution to all your problems. On top of that, you go to heaven when you die. So there's all this you know um, mixture of factors. I think that brought about this. 
faction. So it's a kind of failure of democracy itself, uh, Nigerian democracy, if you like. Do you see it as rooted in colonialism? Well, we have a legacy of colonialism, and they did mention that colonialism basically decided one way they used to rule the people was divide and rule, make the different ethnic groups, you know, kind of compete with each other for the top positions. Mm -hmm. And that legacy still continues. And it's not just between the Christians and the Muslims, it's also between the different ethnic groups. And the leaders kind of perpetuate this system of ruling people. And so you have the little group of these politicians who um, control the resources of the country and whatever you know, the, the, the rest of the people get, they get through patronage. Um, and that's basically what the colonial system did. You to look at it, I think, in one way, under indirect rule, the British separated in different regions. Mm -hmm. Indirect rule is the principle whereby we're not going to interfere with your customs, you can keep your religion, you can you know, keep your political institutions, we're going to add to it. And then with that, the argument of northern Nigeria, because the British rule in Nigeria was from the south, from Lagos. Northerners in the northern region kept a certain independence. We don't need to follow what's going on in the south, these laws that you pass there, they're not relevant in the north because the north is different, there's different religious principles, so we're not going to listen to the rule by Lagos. And it's not an accident that in the independence period, Nigeria is ruled democratically by Muslims. And then the second it gets a Christian president, that's when all the northern states adopt Sharia law. Okay. And the argument of Sharia law is now we have a Christian president, you can pass your laws, but us in the north, you know, we're different, we're separate. That principle of a certain difference is absolutely colonial. And then the argument, and I don't know if this is the case, but the accusation of a group like Jonathan is, he comes from the South, the Obasanjo's principle, and Sharia law came in, he said, look, I'm not gonna interfere. You're gonna do this, I'm not really gonna step in, you'll work it out yourselves. And so when Boko Haram came up, you know, good luck Jonathan seems to operate by a principle, but I'm not really gonna pay attention. Yes, all these people in the north are dying. They can sort it out. It's not really mine to interfere with. And I think that principle definitely has colonial roots, and you can see it operating. I think another aspect of this also is that it's it's it becomes easier to launch the claim of corruption against Muslims who have worked with Christians and others or seculars. And so I think those first generation. So I think this gets to the point that a lot of all of you have made, which is that there's this intra-Muslim con conflict, and I think it goes to the a lot of it is about um, where do you stand on uh, certain principles that we might call reform. Um, and I think not, not going back to the example of a cleric who would or an imam who would perform the um, butchery for Christians um, that. Imam might have been a protective force at one period in history, and some of those imams, those positions of religious leadership changing hands to more um, conservative religious, Muslim religious authorities also means that the protection for all people has, in the region of predominantly Muslim, has suffered. So I think that um, the Muslims who others would say are, are moderate have, have um, this is going back to I think some of these protective forces have died, have also been attacked, have been, have been um, feared, cowed into not standing up for the rights of yeah. people. Uh, of course, we have also, we must have discount the contribution of external forces, you know, like um, Al-Qaeda, um, the invasion of Afghanistan, because the, the initial group um, that started as both of that later became Boko Haram called themselves the, the Taliban. So they were sympathetic to the, you know, the cause of the Taliban in Afghanistan. They actually um, see themselves as, you know, um, as Taliban. They were dressed like that. They, they had beards. They, they dressed like the Pakistan.
Pakistani Taliban, which are Afghanistan Taliban. And they accuse America because of 9 11 and the you know, subsequent uh, anti Islamic rhetoric coming out of America. Um, they, 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 they mention all these things as reasons why they, they hated Western education and why they kind of retreated from democracy and were being, they felt they were being persecuted. Um, so there is also that, in addition to all the policies and the drivers that we mentioned. So it's kind of very complex. Tell us a little bit just about your travels there. Um, who did you meet? Where did you go? What did you see? What did you learn uh, that surprised you? Um, I went to Chibok and made a degree in January this year. And also in March. I, the first trip was actually in December um, 2015. So I did a, about three trips to, to this region, the Northeastern region. The last two visits I went to Chibo. Um, my purpose was to interview some of the girls that escaped. Like I mentioned, there were 57 girls that ran away that escaped that night um, out of the 276 that were taken. So I met some of them, I interviewed them. I also met their parents, um, interviewed some of them, also met some of the um, prominent members of society some pastors and some imams in Chibok um, and interviewed them. But I think one of the one of the things I set out to do when I went there was just to see this place for myself, to to talk to the people as a Nigerian, as a person from there. Um, when all these things were happening, I was living outside the country and I was reading about my country like that, you know. Um, so I wanted to go there and to see what was happening for myself and to, to write about it. Um, what was surprising for me, what was interesting, what what lasts, you know, in my mind is, is the because I know this place has, like I mentioned, peace loving, prosperous. And Nigeria is a one of Af is Africa's largest economy. So there is a lot of um, prosperity, even though educationally that part of the country has always been backwards. Um, but if you know the, the region, the Chad Basin, you know, this trade that's going on between all passing through Medubri, if you want to sell things to, to Cameroon and Niger, you have to go through Medubri. So it's, it was a very prosperous place. People were really having, uh, living a good life there. And then when you go now, you see the devastation. Um, we, we, we went to the IDP camps, where most of the escapees from Boko Haram, uh, because Boko Haram, when they were pushed out of the urban areas, they kind of moved into the, the villages. So they crushed out all the, the people from the villages right away and moved to the city. Um, I was taken around by one of the military commanders and we went to different camps. And you see the, the children um, and the women, not many men, mostly women and children. And you realize that the men have all been conscripted or killed. And it's just the women and I asked him, you know, who are the kids? Are they their children? He said, no, they are not their children. The women are just taking care of them. These are just kids. They just turn up, you know. They were kind of um, rescued or they just turn up and their parents have either been killed. Um, they're just lost. They're just there. And I hear the news, you know, um, this week, uh, the United Nations is saying that about 100,000 people are going to starve. Um, but you saw that, you know, these things, you, you saw the, the, the beginning of all that six months ago when I went there because this commander told me that you know he was in charge of feeding these people and he shouldn't be in charge of feeding them. He was a military commander. There should be provision for the feeding of these people from the government and all that. But he was the one sourcing for food for them. So it was, um, you could see that the whole thing was not well planned. There was no plan on the ground to take care of these people. We're talking about two million people who kind of living in camps. And you pass on the street and you see these lines of women just like endless line of women just waiting, sitting down, waiting for food from the organizations, international organizations. Um, so, you know, these things, uh, I keep thinking about that. These are, these are things that I um, can always stay in my mind. Um, but the main thing is just to write about it, you know, to talk about these things and to, to talk to the people and to 
make my readers realize that these are not just statistics, these are people um, that I met, um, the, the young girls, um, especially. They were like 16 years old, 17 years old when they were taken by Boko Haram. Now they're about 18 or 19. And, and you realize that these are sex kids, you know, these are kids. They've been turned into sex slaves, some of them. The one that, that have been released recently, they came back with kids, all of them have children. They, they, they were um, wives to these fighters. They just took them as their wives, basically to, to have children for the future, soldiers um, for their army. Um, so it's just a mixture of many things, I think. It's a, it's a complex situation. I'd like to get the audience involved in the discussion if you all are so inclined. Um, and if anybody wants to start, we can start now, or I can ask a couple more questions while you think about whether you want to start. Does anybody want to ask anything or say anything? Um, thanks, Linda. Hi, I'm for <coughs> interesting um, comment. I, I have a question about the role of Christianity in all of this, because you've spoken quite some amount about the kind of intra-Muslim debates that were going on and um, the sense of diversity within the Muslim tradition in Nigeria. I wondered if any of you could give a sense of similar debates maybe that are going on within Christianity um, in Nigeria and the kind of different strands of Christianity and you know, perhaps the kind of Pentecostal Christianity generally in these kinds of conflicts um, with Muslims. I mean, I think this is something that um, is mentioned in the book and I think more attention is being paid to not just the rise of new strands of Christianity. I mean, there's been Christianity for you know, decades in this region, and I think that was something that Boko Haram really exposed to people. There are northern Nigerian Christians and have been for, for, for a long time, 100 years or so. But um, I think that considering what impact Christianity has had on religious conflicts, I think there was a tendency to think of Christians um, as victims as they ha have been, um, and also in, even victims of invisibility. But I also think that uh, the um, fervency <coughs> of some new Christian exacerbated tensions. I mean, I think that there's a really careful language in this book about how there's the ability, there are tensions, there are tensions, there are always tensions in society, but the way of exploiting those tensions, uh, there's a discussion about how Boko Haram exploited the things happening in Jos and Kaduna um, and other parts of the country to sort of get Christians and Muslims to be more in contention with each other. So I think that one of one argument that Paul made is that there's a particularly um, vocal and loud brand of Christianity where there are older forms of Christianity that had coexisted with Islam um, and that maybe public preaching um, sort of have also, um, I mean, some of these mission, uh, Christian churches have been planted by the United States or missions from the United States or other European, or European countries. Um, even that could be exploited to say that Christians have this relationship with countries that we see as anti-Islam, right? So I think the American connection to some of these churches can be a problem and something that can be exploited and sometimes those churches may have better financing, may have better connections, may have the ability to get um, access that uh, Muslims in the region don't get. And so it, it can easily be something that can be exploited either locally uh, by Christians or by Muslims, people seeking to, to create division, to create differences, or in some cases maybe to even sustain their community that, that could inadvertently have also some negative consequences on any kind of situation. Yeah. Um, Nigeria is kind of roughly split between Southern Christians and Northern Muslims. That, that's the usual uh, way of describing it. Christians are in the south and Muslims are in the north, but it's more complex than that. There are also Christians in the north, small pockets. I'm from that part, from the Muslim part, but I'm a Christian. So usually there's been more religious conflicts in the north, in the more Muslim dominated north, than in the Christian south. Tensions of religious nature have always been more common in the north. So. Uh, 
Um, and it's always been because of extremist religious Muslim, Muslim groups, either intra, you know, um, within themselves or attacking other non-Muslims. Um, I think from 19, late 1990s, that's when you started having the kind of more radical, charismatic Christian groups emerging um, in southern Nigeria, um, mostly influenced by American televangelists. Um, and they're, they're really big and massive. Um, the pastors drive aeroplanes. Um, that's how big they are. <laughs> <laughs> so they, 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 and they are really extreme in what they do. Um, their followers are, you know, um, I have some of my brothers and sisters who belong to the church, and my sister was sick. I shouldn't take medication. She said she would pray. I said, no, you need to take medication and then pray as well. She said, no, that God is going to heal that. So that, that's, that's the kind of, that's how extreme. So you have the extreme Christians in the South, and then you have the extreme Muslims in the North. So it's, it's just kind of crazy. And now some of the extreme Christian groups are moving into the North, especially the Middle Belt and the um, other more Christian, the Christian pockets in, in the North. So I see this potential um, conflict areas that one day there's going to be this kind of clash because these are both extreme groups. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a clear threat, you know, danger that's definitely going to happen one day. Well, it's happening, but, but it's going to be more extreme, I think, when, when you have this clash. In the group. We have a couple other, several other questions. Let me just ask a bunch of other questions. Well, I'll ask a very quick question to Brian. Since you write a lot about Nigerian media, and if the answer to this is no, we'll just make it quick, is there anything about any of what we're talking about that pertains to changes in the media landscape in Nigeria, such as the onset of the internet and social media? <coughs> this is a book about the Tebow girls. It's not a book about Boko Haram per se. There are many, many killings, mass killings of Boko Haram in Beijing. The reason it's about the Tebow girls is there was an articulation of that through the media that made this the locus around which to base an answer of Boko Haram. So the Tebow kidnapping is a media event. It's a media event for people trying to fight Boko Haram. It's a media event for Boko Haram. So I do think that the media are central to how this plays out. Um, it's not the causal reason these things exist. I mean, I think there is a fundamental tension in the question of Christians. There's Muslim Christian conflicts in Nigeria. And if you look at that, that's a Nigeria specific issue. But yet Boko Haram are an offshoot of a larger jihadi movement mainly coming from Muslim dominant countries where there's not as much Christians. So you could see it as having different forces coming into it. And I think the media is central to how it plays out. Absolutely. And I think Hillen brings it over very well in the book about how either information is restricted, you can't get access to certain people, the information is controlled by the government, or that when you do get access to people, many other people have been talking to them and they're coached in certain ways and you get a sense through the book how much of a media event this stuff could really mm -hmm. uh, Sir, I think you were next. Uh, yeah, we, we gave a nice recap as to what the current situation is, and then we talked a little bit about some of the factors that gave rise to allow Boko Haram to, to be founded. And then we mentioned that you know, Jonathan sort of allowed certain sections to have Sharia law. And to me, the kidnapping of all of these young school kids was Sharia law kind of gone bad, if you want to call it that, or a group that did you know, things that really outraged the whole world. So you know, my question is, you, you saw so much in the press about bringing the girls back home. I mean, Michelle Obama said something about it. The whole world was like horrified. I think it's a great question, and it's a question many Nigerians ask. I think 
they get get mystified in many Nigerians' lives. Good luck, good luck. I'm not Nigerian. Nigerian. It's mystified to me. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's a, why did good luck not <coughs> appear in Boko Haram? Why was his hands off? That's one big question. And then another thing that comes out of the book, I think, very well, is the um, Muhammad Yusuf, the first leader, was a charismatic person that many important people in northern Nigeria went to see. And, you know, Helen described this. That's what makes him like Mirza Tini, this earlier sort of David Koresh type figure who was meant to have incredible powers and who was then put down by the state. But before that, many important state people went to see him. So there's always these rumors of collusion of people in the north that might be supporting it, rumors of it's, it's, it's a little bit
Initially, there was some um, kind of popular support from ordinary Muslims. Um, they, they started as they, they actually had a welfare system. You know, they, they they had their own community where they kind of um, isolated themselves. They had their own schools. The they had their kind of, there, yeah, kind of microfinance institutions. They kind of intermarry between themselves. So it, everything was really like a government within a government. So at that time, there was kind of popular young people, especially would, you know, kind of gravitate to, to Muhammad Yusuf because of his pressure of looking at things and the kind of preaching and his charisma and all that. And of course, the alternative was the government who was doing nothing for these young people. So there was really um, big support for him at that time. But after his death, when they started killing people, really started fighting, and not just people, but they were also killing ordinary Muslims. Um, things kind of started changing. But, but to give you an example of what was happening, young people who were his followers would actually go and kill their own parents who were moderates. Yeah. That's how extreme they were. They would attack their own family and kill their own parents and inform on them because they were not following Muhammad Yusuf's uh, preaching. So it was um, among a particular set of people that you know he had his strongest kind of influence, mostly young people, idealistic, um, ideological. When, when he started fighting and more moderates started kind of distancing themselves from him, you know, especially when he was attacking imams and bombing mosques and churches and all that, he said, no, this is not right. And more and more um, moderate Muslims started speaking out against Muhammad Yusuf and Abu Bakr Shekha and Boko Haram. So there is less support for him now um, among Muslims. So it's only the conscripted and kind of die hard followers who are, you know, still with him because they, they have nowhere to go, basically. They were always seen as extremists, as were the Nigerian Taliban, as seen as slightly crazy. So if you look at, um, they come from a Salafist tradition, 
they're against women's education, but the promotion of women's education comes from that same tradition in Nigeria. So it's not just one thing. So at this point, they've tried to assassinate the head of the largest Sufi movement, the Hiru Bolshi. They've said they're going to assassinate the head of the Zawa, the largest Salafi movement. They tried to, um, they did kill the head of Al Sunnah. So they've attacked many other Muslims, and most of those people, you know, really see them as in the same way we would here. We tend to think in the reading of the time that it's Muslims versus Christians in two homogenous blocks. But as you were saying, there are different sorts of Christian groups and there are different sorts of Muslim groups, and it becomes far more um, complex. So there is this issue of why is it so attractive in the Northeast? What are the conditions that lead people to go and join it? Part of that is the attack of the Nigerian government in reprisal and then the alienation of people from the state that drove people there. And then that in the rest of the country, amongst Muslims generally, I think there's this general sense of this is out of control. People are absolutely desirous of Buhari going in and, and sorting the problem out. Uh, Ma'am, I'll give you the last, last my, word. My, yes, thank you. My first question was an answer this gentleman over here regarding uh, the interest shown all over the world at the outset. But I've also heard that the president of Nigeria knew at the beginning where these girls were, but for political reasons, he did nothing. And I wonder if there's any truth to that rumor. I am not sure if that's the case. I, I don't know anything about that. But, but um, the, the, everybody knew just the general location was in Sabisa Forest. This was where the girls were kept. Um, everybody knew that. But to get there, you know, this is a very remote forest area. And the rumor at that time is that the, the girls were always being moved across the border because, like I said, this is the border region between two different countries. So they were constantly being moved because Boko Haram knew the significance of these girls. And they were very, very careful to, to they broke them up into different groups and they would move them across international borders, uh, always constantly moving them. So it, it was not easy to just go and grab them, you know. Um, that's at least what I heard, what I, what I know. I think this gets also this, these rumors and these um, a loss of belief in various stories, I think, gets back to the issue of corruption in plaguing um, the response, because I think also that no, there was a crisis of belief in the information that people got. The military, within the military, there was, I think there were at least two, um, uh, two defections uh, at different points where the military, the Nigerian military was not believing what they had been told or segments of the population within the military was not believing it. The Nigerian government working with foreign governments, there was a lot of mistrust. Um, and I think fundamentally some of these issues do come back to this point about corruption because it's not just corruption as sort of a transactional issue that you pay for something, but it's a loss of belief in information that people get from authorities, the media, um, you know, whoever it is. And so I think that um, some of the responses uh, only generated more rumors. And there was a lot of um, questioning about who was actually in control of the situation. And so this is I think there were a lot of rumors flying around about Jonathan himself, his state of mind. If he knew something, what was he actually doing? His wife's behavior, the first lady's behavior. Yeah. Uh, so there was, I, I do think this underlying issue, or this issue of corruption is what leads to these communities that become isolated and dependent on a charismatic leader and provisionally, you know, providing for themselves on an individual or a small scale, crisis in state belief. I think cor corruption is central to the fallout as well as central to the failures in response. Um, so I think the rumor, I'm glad you used that word, rumor, because I think there were a lot, there have been a lot of rumors, um, and and maybe maybe intentional rumor mongering yeah. as well, so that the response would be stymied. But that's my 